the radiology of heart failure. Before looking at any x-rays or CTs, it's important to go back to basic anatomy. This is the secondary pulmonary lobule, which is about one to two centimeters in diameter. In the center of the secondary pulmonary lobule, you've got a pulmonary artery and a bronchus, and they are of the same magnitude. In the periphery, you've got the pulmonary vein and the lymphatics. And the periphery includes the interlobular septum. So the vein and the, art and the uh, lymphatics actually run in the interlobular septum. And note that the uh, vein is red because it carries oxygenated blood and the artery is blue because it carries deoxygenated blood. So for the purposes of heart failure, you need to remember the interlobular septum because this is where fluid is going to collect in the case of pulmonary venous hypertension. So if you've got some resistance to pulmonary venous backflow back to the left atrium because of heart failure, you get pulmonary venous hypertension and plasma and fluid leaks out of the pulmonary veins into the interlobular septum, giving the so-called curly B lines. And a curly B line is a line which is perpendicular to a pleural surface, and they are seen usually at the lung bases, perpendicular to the lung edge, as the X-ray beam hits the interface tangentially. Don't forget, though, that curly B lines are also caused by lymphangitis carcinomatosa because when you have lymphadenopathy, which is obstructing the lymphatic return, you can then get lymph fluid in the interlobular septum, giving you a curly B line. This is a patient who has interstitial pulmonary edema. Here are the curly B lines which are lines of fluid in the interlobular septum caused by pulmonary venous hypertension. Note also that in spite of this being a portal, portable film, you can see that there is upper lobe blood diversion. So the pulmonary veins are quite distended in the apex. Note in this patient that the ET tube is a little low lying and needs pulling back. Here are the curly B lines in the right costophrenic angle. Here is another case of a patient who has both interstitial and alveolar pulmonary edema. If you notice in the right costophrenic angle, there is a linear density which parallels the chest wall. And this is due to fluid collecting between the visceral pleura and the lung. So it's not truly a pleural effusion because it's not in the pleural space. But actually it is trapped between the lung, which is bordered by this white line and the visceral pleural, which is bordered by the blue line. So it's not in the pleural space, it's in the space, or potential space, between the lung and the visceral pleura. Now once you see a lamellar effusion with curly B lines, the diagnosis is virtually always going to be heart failure. So it's actually a quite a powerful sign. Here is another example of heart failure, we've got alveolar edema, we've got cardiomegaly, we've got upper lobe blood diversion, and we've got a lamella pleural effusion with curly B lines, better seen on this view here. Sometimes you can diagnose heart failure on a CT. This patient has a left pleural effusion with thickened interlobular septa. This is due to engorged fluid 
of pulmonary venous hypertension or heart failure. Here is another case. Patient has fluid in the horizontal fissure. They have bilateral pleural effusions and interlobular septal thickening, which is due to fluid in the interlobular septum caused by pulmonary venous hypertension. This patient has heart failure. So just to recap, the secondary pulmonary lobule shows the interlobular septum through which the lymphatics and the pulmonary veins run. And so any fluid that leaks out of these vessels because of obstruction at the hilum or pulmonary venous hypertension or left atrial hypertension, you will get these curly B lines. The next stage in heart failure is where the interstitial pulmonary edema then leads to alveolar pulmonary edema. So when the interlobular septa have become engorged, the next stage is for fluid to leak in to the centre of the secondary pulmonary lobule into the alveolar airspaces. So we've got consolidation in a perihilar position. It's bilateral and symmetrical. Note also the patient has bilateral pleural effusions. There aren't too many curly B lines, but I can be fairly confident that this is pulmonary edema. And coupled with a sudden onset of breathlessness in the patient's history, the diagnosis is virtually guaranteed. Unlike a lamellar pleural effusion, the pleural effusion that occurs in this patient is actually in the real pleural space between the visceral and parietal pleura. Here is the bat's wing pulmonary edema. Here is another case of pulmonary edema. The patient is semi-erect on ITU. The nasogastric tube is shown in the stomach. It's seen bisecting the carina and crossing the diaphragm in the midline. There is perihilar alveolar pulmonary edema. This is the same exposure using beam hardening or edge enhancement uh, to identify the tubes. So you often see this in ITU patients, um, but it also denotes the pulmonary edema. Here is a young lady who postpartum developed acute onset pulmonary edema. You can see uh, alveolar shadowing. It's difficult to see whether or not there is or there isn't a pleural effusion. The patient underwent CT uh, to exclude uh, pulmonary emboli. And the CT very nicely shows this perihilar alveolar pulmonary edema. You can just make out some curly B lines. So there is evidence of interstitial pulmonary edema in this patient. Here is a, another patient on ITU, ET tube in situ. There's a right internal jugular line. The NG tube is intubating the right main bronchus and right lower lobe bronchus, and that needs to be removed immediately. But there's a very nice demonstration of bilateral perihilar bat's wing pulmonary edema with a left pleural effusion. Yet another case of bat's wing pulmonary edema. And yet another case, bilateral perihilar airspace shadowing, also called bat's wing pulmonary edema. Finally, one last case, pulmonary edema. It's a portable film. The distribution is still perihilar in appearance with some peripheral spurring. So in summary, the chest x-ray in heart failure gives you upper lobe blood diversion. You may or may not get cardiomegaly depending on whether the patient has had uh, pre-existing ischemic heart disease. Now, if somebody has an acute myocardial infarction, they may not necessarily get cardiomegaly uh, 
before they get pulmonary edema. Curly B lines are a prominent feature in interstitial pulmonary edema, but note also you can see it in lymphangitis. A prior history of malignancy plus all the uh, associated radiological features would help in that diagnosis. A lamella pleural effusion, this is a really important radiological sign because when this is seen in combination with curly B lines and an appropriate history, gives you a definite diagnosis of heart failure. Classical bat's wing pulmonary edema is diagnostic of heart failure in the right setting. Pleural effusions are a common feature. Don't forget that rapid development of chest x-ray changes is very frequent in heart failure. The improvement occurs rapidly, but so too does deterioration.